Good morning, church. The reading for this morning comes from Acts 11, 1 to 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I, absor I observed animals and beasts, prey, and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinctions. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. Mm. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. who was I that I could stand in God's way. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Yeah. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. If we haven't met before, my name's Reino. I have the privilege of serving this awesome church as pastor, and I also have the privilege of preaching the word to you this morning, opening up the Bible with you, and seeing uh, what it has in store for us. Uh, I'm glad to be back preaching. I took a little preaching break for three weeks, and I'm also glad to be back from leave. I had a week of leave last week, which was great. We also left Pretoria for some rest and recovery, uh, and it's good to be back. I'm happy to see you. It's lekker om to see and really, really excited about what this uh, day holds for us. We have been in the book of Acts, and once again, let me show you a map of the book of Acts. It's always helpful if you study a big book like Acts, that you kind of have a big picture in mind. And uh, if you look at the first part, the introduction, and then chapters 2 to 7 in Jerusalem, we've already covered those in both season 1 and then in the start of season 2. One huge game changer in the beginning of the book of Acts, and that was Pentecost. The pouring out of God's Spirit on all His people, empowering them to do the works and ministry of Jesus and to carry the good news into the world from Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Huge, huge moment at the beginning of the book of Acts. And then, over the past couple of weeks, we've been in this really important section, which is chapters 8 to 12. If I can just have the next slide, please, Rudolf. So, two massive game changers in this small section in the book. The one is the conversion of Saul of Tarshish, and the second one is this huge part in the middle, named on this little drawing, Peter and Cornelius, and this is where we'll be today. So over the past two weeks, I personally think that both Lesicho and Murindeni did a wonderful job in spotlighting Paul and his conversion and what that means for us. Just a little plug on the side. Remember that we do record our sermons and they are available both on audio and on video. So if you missed it or if you want to watch it again or if you want to send it to someone, uh, you know where to find them on our podcast and our YouTube channel. So today we'll be in the middle and in this middle section of this bigger part, chapters 8 to 12, we are going to see another huge game changer. Okay, so this is a super important part of the story, and it's a huge part of the story. 
I call it a double header. You guys know sometimes, like when you watch a series, they need two episodes to cram one story into. So they call it part one and part two, and then they refer to it loosely as a double header. Okay, so you must get that feeling today. It's an extra long portion of scripture, all the way from Acts 9, 32 to 11, 18. And we are going to have to watch it in one sitting, and you will also see some repetition. So this part that Chanel read now is repeated twice in the sex section of Scripture from 9.32 onwards. So we've seen ministry happen in Judea, as it was said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We are now seeing ministry happening in Samaria. And this part today will set us up for the end of the earth which is really, really exciting. And we are only ending it in chapter 11. We have another 17 chapters to come after that. I am going to use the word racism today. I will also use words like preference. I will use words like prejudice. I will use words like superiority. When we hear these words, it brings a response. We have thoughts connected to it. We have emotions connected to it. Some of us might even have arguments about it. Let's acknowledge it. Even when I said it now, you felt and thought certain things. I will not talk about these things from a political point of view. I will also not talk about it from a sociological point of view, and neither will I talk about it from an anthropological point of view. That means the study of humanity. I will talk about these things from a biblical perspective. So let's allow the text to guide us. I'll explain the text as we go, and we'll apply it as we go. So may I ask you this morning, as the teacher of the word today, let us disarm our thoughts, and let us just disarm our hearts, and let's submit ourselves to the scriptures, and let's journey together as brothers and sisters as we walk through it. Uh, as we walk through this portion of scripture. If you are not a Christian, but you are sitting here today, we can't journey together as brothers and sisters, unfortunately, but we can still journey together. And I do trust that you will find this vision of the church that we see in this portion of Acts and uh, this vision of the Christian faith very, very compelling. And I'm trusting that it will enthrall your mind. As a transcultural church, the definition that Zita gave us while hosting us really well, we take this very, very seriously. So we talk about it often, we try and live it, and we try and model it as good as we can. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open up your word now, we submit ourselves to it. We are open to hear what you uh, want us to hear. You are our Lord. You are the Lord of all. You are the resurrected one. You are the one who has all wisdom and all knowledge, the one that is almighty. And Lord Jesus, we deem it a great privilege to be called your church, your body, your hands and feet here on planet Earth, in Pretoria, in Centurion, in the Hoovers and Burenkloof, exactly where you put us. I pray that you would uh, guide our thoughts and hearts as we work through this portion of Scripture. And may your name be glorified, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. So guys, because it's such a colossal portion of Scripture, I framed it for you. Okay, well, I found a frame which I'm going to share with you. So the frame was done by Dr. Tony Merida, who I have great respect. So here's our theme for today, Grace for Every Race. We'll be covering 9.32 to 11.18. And here's a really simple frame for you guys. Six movements. It's not six points, but six movements. We'll see introductions. We'll be introduced to Peter. And we'll be introduced to Cornelius. I tried to say, as I was prepping, Cornelius, but it's really tough for me, okay? So we'll see Peter and Cornelius being introduced. We'll see visions. Peter will see a vision. Cornelius will see a vision. We'll see obedient responses by both Cornelius first and then Peter. We'll see the gospel being proclaimed by Peter. We'll see a divine confirmation, which is a Pentecost happening, and then we'll see a humble resolution by the Judean believers in chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. If you want to take a photo of it, you are welcome. It is a huge, huge, huge portion of Scripture. So the teaching text was the last part. 
which means that if you look at it now, we will end with a humble resolution by the Judean believers. So I spoiled the end a little bit, but it's just so that you know where we are headed. Let's look at the first one, introductions to both Peter and to Cornelius. So I'll have the section up on the slides. I don't know where that one numbering comes from. It sits quite odd in the top left corner. So everyone who struggles with OCD, justification, centering, and align left, relax, okay? Settle, settle. I struggle with that, so I know the formula. Okay, so there's 932, and then there's 10 verses 1 to 2. Why is Peter introduced again? Well, we haven't heard about him for a while, because it was all about Saul in the past couple of chapters. Secondly, we read about Peter, and we see what Peter does. So he heals a paralyzed man, and then he raises a lady called Tabitha from the dead, which once again confirms Peter's apostolic authority. Remember, the Spirit was poured out, the apostles had the teaching and the eyewitness, and they were the ones who told people how it works. And as they told people the gospel, they saw all of these magnificent things happening, both miracles and people being raised from the dead, like in this portion, and then people um, uh, also being, um, the Holy Spirit also being poured out over people. Peter is traveling, he's doing it by foot, maybe by donkey, who knows. But he's been in Lydda, so he's left Jerusalem, and he's traveled northwest towards the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. We see him ministering in Sharon. We see him ministering in Joppa, which is another 20 kilometers from Lydda. And then we see that he travels another ultramarathon, a 50 kilometer to Caesarea, and he's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so just think of a colossal road trip. And what we see Peter doing, I'm not going to read the whole portion, but what we see people doing, and this is really uh, what we see Peter doing, this is really important for us, is he's imitating his Lord. Look at chapter 9, verse 40 to 41. Okay, it says, Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, he prayed, and turning toward the body, said, Tabitha kum, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. He called the saints and widows and presented her alive. Unbelievable miracle. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse 40 to 42. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. This is Jesus now. He took the child's father, mother, and those who were with him and entered the place where the child was. And then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita kum. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old, and at this they were utterly astounded. Guys, it's like a carbon copy, <coughs> sorry, of the same miracle. It's really only the B and the T, you know? Talita kum, which means little girl. Tabita kum means little boki, like little deer, little gazelle, little goat, little sweetie. That's what Peter said to her. Isn't it absolutely phenomenal? So this is what Peter's doing. He's imitating his Lord. And then in 943, there's a little detail in the text that I just want to show you to. He says, Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, another Jewish man, who was a leather tanner. Now, it's odd for Peter to stay with a tanner. Why? Because a tanner worked with dead animals and animal skins. He worked with his hands and made leather products. So in Jewish custom and uh, uh, religious uh, um, laws, you were unclean if you touched anything that was dead. So there's a way in which you were supposed to become clean again, and that's described in the book of Leviticus. So if Peter was clean according to the rule of law, and he entered Simon the Tanner's house, which was an unclean house, then Peter would also be unclean. So it's odd for Peter to stay there. I think the best way to think about it is knowing that you shouldn't really be walking around these streets in the night, but it's kind of working out for you tonight, so you'll do it. Ne? That's where Peter is at. But it's a really important detail, and we'll see why a little bit later. Let's look at Cornelius. So he gets uh, uh, introduced in 10 verses 1 to 2. He was a man in Caesarea. He was a centurion, which means that he was a commander in the Roman army, and he was part of a really important part of the Roman army, just referred to in this text as the Italian regiment. He was a devout man. And he feared God. The word literally is he was a God-fearer. 
along with his own household, and he was a great guy, and he did a lot of wonderful things. That's what it says in 10 verses 1 to 2. Now, he's wealthy, he's influential, and he's referred to as a God-fearer. Now, this is really important. So, a God-fearer was a word used for people outside the Jewish, uh, um, the Jewish family of God that had reverence for the God of the Bible, but they weren't Jewish. Does that make sense? So loosely referred to as Gentiles. So anyone who was outside, who had respect for this God, was called a God-fearer to acknowledge that they acknowledge our God. But it wasn't quite saying like he's one of us. Okay, simple example. Let's say we would have a final in South Africa, and Kaiser Chiefs would play in the final, and I would go, yeah, I'm a kosi, ne? Bafana, bakatula, nakola, peace and love. Then Muran then he would go, oh, I thought you supported Matsatsansa. And then I would say, no, 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 look, look, I am a fan of Super Sports United, but today, because it's the final, and because Matsatsansa is not playing, I'm a Chiefs fan. And then Muran then he would go, you're not quite a Chiefs fan. You know what I mean? Like, you're a final Chiefs fan, but you're not really a Chiefs fan. You guys feel me? So that's what a god fear it meant. Like, we can't just shun the guy because he has respect for our God, but he's not an insider. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's not really one of us. So Peter, traveling around, staying in an unusual place, and then we get introduced to this guy who's completely the opposite of Peter, but there's something brewing inside. We are set up for an awesome story here. Are you guys feeling me? So staying in an unusual place and God already working inside of someone. Okay, then we see visions. So these are the two people, that's the main characters of this story. And then we see visions in 10 verses 3 to 6 and then also in verses 11 to 16. Okay, it's up on the screen if you do want to read it. Uh, Cornelius' vision is really short. Actually, let's read it together quickly. About 3 in the afternoon, this is Cornelius now, he distinctly saw a vision uh, an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius, staring at him and always said, What is it, Lord? The angel told him, Your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa. Call for Simon, who's also known Peter. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. So that's his vision. The most simple way to probably describe his vision is, Cornelius, God sees you. I think it's brilliant. And how encouraging is it in this portion of Scripture to see that someone who is seeking and genuinely making an effort to understand this God of the universe is being seen by God. That's awesome for me. Okay, then we see Peter's vision, a little bit longer, and was in the portion of Scripture that Chanel read now, so I won't be reading it again. But Peter's response to his vision is, Sheesh! Yuck! Bleh. Like, that is definitely not my vibe. And three times, that is what Peter says. Huh? Classic Peter, let's be honest. Betrays Jesus not once, but three times. Gets reinstated and recommissioned by Jesus not once, but three times. And here we go again, lack of pity. Three times, he says, no, I don't do that. That is not my vibe. That cannot be true. I shall not. It's too far, it's too strange, it doesn't fit my preference, it absolutely uh, illuminates my prejudice, I struggle with this, I'm not going to do it. And this is a conversion experience of the Apostle Peter. It's really important to see it. So Peter was raised hearing this, he was taught this, and he believed this to be true. And he also believed that this was the will of God, that he will not do these things and mix with these people. And now God calls him to a radical conversion, away from something newly pointed into something new. Now we know that Peter struggled with this because he said no. He'll acknowledge a little bit later in this portion of Scripture that it is strange for him. And once again, even after Acts 15, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul has to rebuke Peter and say, Dude, come on now. Do we still have to speak about your prejudice against the Gentiles? Like only a couple of months ago, you were solid, dude, and now you're forgetting it again. It was a struggle for the Apostle Peter. And we see him here not being converted to Christianity, but we see him being converted away from his own preferences and prejudices. Now note the tanner again. He's already stayed with a guy that's unclean. 
and he was actually quite okay with it. And then he had this vision, and he didn't want it, but then he said yes. This is also a really strange portion of Scripture in which you see this little oxymoron, no, Lord. <laughs> that sentence actually has no right to exist. Like, you can't respond to Jesus in that way. Can you imagine? Reino, please love your neighbor. No, Lord, not today. Not really feeling it. Hey, Reino, why don't you give generously to the church you attend? Nah, Lord, not a great idea. I might circle back to that a little bit later. Like, you can't respond to Jesus like that. And we see that it wasn't a great idea for Peter in this part. Now, look at his reaction in verse 17 of chapter 10. It says that he is deeply perplexed. He is puzzled. His response is, what? Do you guys know that emoji? Blush cheeks, big eyes, round mouth. Like that's his response. But he obeys right away. Are you guys keen to hear a little bit of my story? Can I put my stuff out to you? Is this a safe space? My own conversion story has a moment like this. And it went like this. I submitted my life to Jesus in the early hours of the 18th of May of 2005 in my room, crying, lying on my face on my carpet after I wanted to commit suicide. So I was planning on committing suicide that evening, and my plans didn't work out. So the only alternative I had was to just relinquish all. That next morning, I called the pastor, and I said to him, dude, you need to help me. I have way too much sin, and if I die now, I'm most definitely going to hell. And he said, well, come to my house, and we'll chat it through. Went to his house, confessed my sin, told him how I feel, cried for many hours. This is the abridged version of the story. And then uh, right at the end, he walked me out of my car. I was driving a Corsa at that time, 160 IS, free flow exhaust, a little verpa going there, uh, lots of inches on my wheels. And he said to me, listen, I know, you'll feel the Holy Spirit start working inside of you now. And it might feel strange to you. But here's what I want you to do. You obey right away. Okay? I said, okay, cool. And he goes, because even if you do the wrong thing, you still try to obey. And I was like, okay, that's great advice. And I remember sitting in the car, closing the door, seeing him walk over the street, and I felt the Spirit speaking to me, immediately. And I felt the Spirit say to me four things. Firstly, you are done cussing, or swearing. You are done fighting with your mother. I still lived with my parents at the time. You are done driving like it's fast and nefarious. I was one of those guys that was cool like that. I never even wore my seatbelt. And I felt the Spirit say to me, you are done being a racist. And I was like, okay. So four things, immediately, obey right away, let's do it. Seatbelt on, fourth gear, 60 kilometers an hour, one hand at 10, one hand at 2, law-abiding citizen, I turn from Roderick's Avenue into Linwood, and what do I have? A conglomerate of minibus taxis, absolutely testing my very first act of obedience. And I remember wanting to be who I was, and realizing, oh, wait, 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 wait. I must not do this anymore. I must not speak like this anymore. I cannot think like this anymore. I was just told to stop it. So I'm going to stop it. Peter is just told to do it. And he did it. It's a powerful, obedient response from Peter. Let's look at their responses. So in 10, 7 to 8, and then 21 to 23, this is their responses. Cornelius' response, straightforward. He's got a lot of power, a lot of money. He's like, gents, get going. This is what we are going to do now. Look at Peter's response. So the text says that the guys who came stood outside the gate. Look at verse 21. I just want to find it here. Then Peter went down to the men. Oh, so sorry. Um, verse 17. It says, while Peter was deeply perplexed, it says, the people who were sent by Cornelius stood at the gate. They are not allowed to come into the gate, to the door. Why? Because they are part of them. 
they're just not welcome. So they stood at the gate asking, can we please see Peter? And look what, happen, uh, look what happens in verse 23. Then Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. Guys, this is groundbreaking. This is absolutely phenomenal. This is the first of its kind for Peter. Think about this. Peter has never set foot in a house of these people. Peter has never had one of them in his house. But because God spoke to him and because he was obedient, he said, come in. Clearly, God is doing something here. Let me get in on it. And let me accept what God just told me. God is at work. We've heard this many times. We hear it weekly. Guys, think about it now. Here where we are, there are Corneliuses outside the gates of this church looking and searching. We are the Peters in this area, connecting the dots for the people who are actually seeking. May we have the eyes to see who's seeking. And may we have the eyes to see people, especially when they are outside our liking or outside our preferences. Because our liking and our preferences and our prejudice and all the isms and all the phobias we struggle with keep us away from people. It alienates us from other human beings. That is why it has to go. That is why it has to be dealt with. That is why we have to be done with it. Because any slur or any cultural, whatever you might call it that you struggle with, or any phobia alienates us from human beings who God loves. Deeply. As much as He loves you. Deeply. Think about the places you frequent. Think about who you sit down with. to Think about our barbers. Many, <clears throat> there's nothing like going to the barber having a phenomenal conversation, and then calling our brother Francois, who goes to the same barber, and going, dude, we had a really good chat. Where are you guys at? What did you guys talk about last time? Like, we intentionally go to the same barber to build that kind of relationship with him. It's just an example. Think of all our little sub-communities in this area. There's so many places in which people need to be seen. And there's so many people that can be brought into a place like this where this us and them divide will be no longer. Or where we at least intentionally try and bridge it. And we are humble about it. And we confess our sins and we repent when we struggle with it. And we live a new kind of story. That day at Albie's house, right after I heard from the Spirit, I didn't get it right, but I've been on a 17 and a half year journey from that, well, a little bit more than 17 years, from that moment up until now. Constant journey of repentance and understanding and confessing and living in a new way. We've been placed here to model this and to show this welcome to the other. Let me show you a quick quote from an academic paper that was released in the town planning space, I think in the month of June. So our brother Christian in this church, he works as a town planner and he also dabbles in the academic space. And he read this article and then he sent us on either article plus this awesome quote. So this article talks about, just before you show the quote, please Rudolf. This article talks about um, how communities have become deracialized and desegregated. So how communities that was previously a white community or a black community has now become a mixed community with other races and ethnicities in between as well. And then the article from a town planning perspective asks, has this helped us? Like are people getting along better? Are we still experiencing racism, etc.? The stuff that we experienced from a previous time. And then he makes the point that even though people might live in proximity with one another, it doesn't actually help us to bridge those gaps because of various reasons. I won't go into that. But then the guy writes this about the church in academic paper about town planning, right? Look what he says. He says, amidst this dispiriting picture, this is the fact that we still struggle, the institutions of faith offer a welcome contrast and spaces where the different population groups meet. They provide support and guidance to those struggling with the rapid pace of South Africa's transition 
Religious principles and values are common denominators for people of different racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. Levels of conflict are low, and religion unifies more than it divides. And the level of social capital is high. How beautiful is this, guys? This church is one of those places. Woo, come on. Like, I really leap out of my chair when I read an email. But I did. Because I thought this was phenomenal. This is, where, this is what we are busy with, guys. Feel the privilege and also feel the weight and the importance of what we're busy doing. So then from verse 24 onwards, we are headed to the end of the earth. Why? Because there's a new frontier now. Something has happened that has unlocked the gospel to go further than it had gone up until that point. And if we continue reading the text, you'll see that there was this beautiful meeting between the two. A really, really humble meeting. Look at verses uh, 25 and 26. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him. He fell at his feet and he worshipped him. That's really humble. Look at Peter. But Peter lifted him up and said, stand up. I myself am also a man. Come on. We're the same, dude. No difference between us. Peter just struggled with that, but he obeyed and he humbled himself and Cornelius humbled himself and now the gospel is going to be heard by people who were not able to hear it before. <laughs> and what I like, if you look at a verse, uh, verse 28, look at Peter being really honest. He says, Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. And that's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. How beautiful is this from Peter? I mean, Peter stands in a room full of people different than him, and he goes, yeah, guys, uh, look, I'm going to be honest. I feel a little odd here. I feel a little out. I'm not really supposed to do this, but I am here now. What do you guys need to hear? And then... He proclaims the gospel, which is the fourth movement. So a gospel proclamation from Peter. I think we should read it. Yeah, we'll read it now. So look how easy Peter shares the gospel when he has the opportunity to do it. He's straightforward. He's very clear. He's rooted in conviction. And he has got confidence in a very simple gospel. Do you guys see it? Like Peter doesn't go on a segue. He doesn't go off on a tangent. Peter keeps to what he knows. And he says, Jesus is Lord of all. If you've never heard the gospel explained this simply, tune your ears to it now. Jesus is Lord of all. Then he speaks about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the return of Jesus. And then he says, the Bible says all of this. What an easy sermon. And what a simple gospel presentation, right? Let's read. Peter began to speak. No, please, uh, Tar, sorry, I meant no, Rudolf, please don't change the slide. Sorry. Thanks, Rudolf. Appreciate that. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent a message to the Israelites. Now check. Here's his sermon. He sent a message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of uh, peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Like, let's start there. And then he speaks about the life of Jesus. He says, you know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good, that's the life of Jesus, and healing also the life of Jesus, and who under the, tyr the tyranny of the devil, because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, you can believe it, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. There's Jesus' death. God raised up this man on the Thursday and caused him to be seen. There's his resurrection. Not by all people, 
but by us whom God appoints as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I saw him. We had a little fussy as a meal, like he was real. This isn't a fairy tale. And then he says he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. There's the return of Jesus. And then he says, all the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. You can believe this. Isn't this a really simple gospel presentation? And it's true for you as well today as we listen to this. Do you remember question of the day that we asked? I asked that question intentionally. Because if you're a believer, when we get the chance, this should be so big a part of us that we are able to talk about it for 20 minutes. And that we are able to talk about it as simple and as clear as Peter did. May I encourage you again to not miss an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. And may I also encourage you to not make it complicated. That really isn't a complicated sermon. It's very simple, but it is the truth. And it brought salvation to people. The fifth part of this portion of scripture is a divine confirmation. It happens in 10, 44 to 48. And here's, here's what I want you to see. They needed to hear this message. They had to find the evangelist. Even though Cornelius was close, he didn't get saved just because he continued doing good. He got saved because he believed. And what did he believe in? The good news that was preached or proclaimed or declared to him. There is only one way in, guys. And it's the church's job to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to find that one way in. Like we can't live with this understanding that most people kind of know that there is a God. Or the census says that South Africa is a predominantly Christian country. Or often people in South Africa are not hostile to religion or faith. All of those things might be true. But if people don't hear that faith in Jesus Christ is the way that you get in on it, they will perish. And this awesome group of people in Caesarea, having all this wealth and doing all these awesome things, were not saved until they heard that last line that was written in verse 43. And then this awesome thing happens. It's a Pentecost. Again, same game changer as in the beginning, but now with people who were outside the original gangsters. And the Holy Spirit gets poured out on them, it's very similar, if you read it slowly, to the same pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And Peter couldn't even finish his sermon. I wrote a note here to myself, lol. Can you imagine if Peter had a real ripper at the end, and he was like, Whoo, I am teeing this bad boy up, I am going to land this plane on a high note. And then they just abruptly end his sermon. Why? Because the Spirit comes down on them. And look at verse 48. That's really, really Really important, because this is how beautiful the whole story ends. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to stay for a few days. Where? Among people who he would not have ever stayed with. In a place that the Jewish people didn't really care about. Can we be together now? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Awesome. Welcome. That's what the Spirit does. That's God's will for His church. Is that when His Spirit gets poured out on people, then these walls fall down. This walls of hostility, Paul calls it in Ephesians 2. We'll get to that in the benediction. It breaks down and it finishes with people being together. Guys, I could actually end the sermon here. Because that is just a beautiful picture of what God was busy doing through His church. Let's look at the last one, and then we'll land. The last one is the humble resolution from the Judean believers. So after all of this awesomeness, Peter gets criticism. Peter receives condemnation. Peter spoke to people from a party. Now look, I did laugh in our current political landscape. 
with party names and everyone pushing for early elections, I did laugh about the word, the circumcision party. I did. I thought to myself, that sounds quite intense. But that's what it says in the scripture. Like the people who criticized him and condemned him were from the circumcision party. I was like, woo, that's hardcore. Okay. But there's people who listen to this whole story and says, God cannot or at least should not save people like them. The gospel cannot be for, for that person. Because I don't like them. They're outside my preference. I'm prejudiced towards them. And look what Peter does. He tells them the story. Bold testimony. Says it like it is. And he speaks the truth to the, Juda the Judean believers. And look at how it lands. He tells them the story. And look at verse 18. When they heard this, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, So then, God has given repentance, resulting in life, even to the Gentiles. Look at Peter's response as he tells the story in 17. How could I possibly hinder God? Isn't that just a beautiful Humble submission to God's instructions for Peter and then for his church. This isn't the last time the church spoke about this. A couple of chapters on in Acts 15, we'll see the church coming together again, talking about these man-made things that keep us apart from one another and how we should deal with them so that we can bridge those divides. The Apostle Paul, who is currently Saul, but he'll be Paul in just a couple of chapters' time. His writings are, are full of this. Okay, So this wasn't the last time the church had to deal with this. But here's what I want you to see, and this is very important. The fact that the church humbly accepted this, and the fact that the church made this resolution, means that you and I, today, in 2022, have the privilege of being here. Scanning through the faces really quickly and knowing some of your stories. I don't think that any one of us comes from the family of Peter. Like none of us have got proper Jewish roots that we can trace back, right, to someone in this Judean community in Acts. I am of French descendants. So I'm actually Renaud Meyer. <laughs> but I am Afrikaans. I'm just the mayor. But I'm a Christian. Why? Because the church decided that everyone needs to hear the good news. The church decided here that they cannot decide where they'll keep the good news. They will say it to all because God said that they should. And now we're Christian. And we are brothers and sisters. And we are part of this beautiful global body made up of approximately 2.2 billion people. Very different from one another, but unified rather than divided because of what God decided to do by showing a vision to these two people and these two people obediently responding. I mean, I often think of getting to heaven and then being able to ask a whole lot of questions to many people that I would like to ask some questions. After reading this portion of scripture again, I think I'll go, guys, can you show me who Cornelius is? I, I want to meet the guy. Because this was such an important moment in the book of Acts. Let me offer you two really short exhortations. And while I do this, Stephen, you and Lucifer are, are welcome to come up to lead, to lead us in a last song. A really simple line with a very intentional word chosen. Listen to this. First one. Jesus shows hospitality to all races. And we must imitate him. The word imitate is the intentional word. I showed you with intention in the beginning how Peter literally did what he saw Jesus doing. And then when Jesus said, he obeyed right away. So Jesus shows hospitality to all races and we must imitate him. 
this is the place to deal with these things. This is the place to humble ourselves. This is the place to repent. This is the place to struggle together. Because we have enough common denominators here as brothers and sisters in Christ to actually, listen to our definition, transcend all of this, rise above it, and to create one new community in Christ. I'm not saying that all of us should have all of this sorted out. I'm asking that we imitate our Lord and that we show hospitality to one another. And then the last thing, Jesus commands us to preach and we should proclaim Him. And I will beat this drum until we plant the next church and then I'll go and beat that drum there. We have to preach the gospel to all people. We should not let any opportunity slip. Amen. Amen.